Hello, everybody, and welcome to our last Revive webinar of this year. I'm Astrid Pensmoor, and I will be hosting this session on innovation in point of care diagnostics for sepsis and bloodstream infections, which we have had the pleasure to organize with Nesta Challenges. Before we get started, a little back background about our project. The Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P, launched the Education and Outreach Program, REVIVE, in 2018. REVIVE aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded in full and can be viewed after the live broadcast on our website, revive.gardp.org slash webinars. Please visit the Revive website to stay up to date about our future webinars, watch recordings of previous webinars, and also to find information about our other activities. Today we will have three presentations, which will be followed by a question and answer session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions window in your webinar control panel, as shown on this slide. We will address these questions after the final presentation, and we will do our best to respond to as many as possible. I'm now happy to welcome Caroline Perslow from Nesta Challenges, who will moderate today's webinar, as well as our three speakers. I'm now handing over to you, Caroline. Welcome. Thanks, Astrid. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Caroline Perslow. Um, I work in the global health team at Nesta Challenges. Nesta Challenges is part of Nesta, which is an innovation foundation in London, and our department runs challenge prizes, and in particular, the Longitude Prize, which is one of the reasons that we're here today. So just to start, before I introduce our three speakers, I wanted to give a brief introduction to the Longitude Prize. Um, and I should say that Till um, is one of our judges, and Amrita and David are both competing in the prize. So the Longitude Prize started in 2014, um, and it's now been going for five years. It's due to close next September. It's an eight million pound prize. Uh, we're operational in many countries based out of London, and we're looking for a transformative, rapid, accurate, and affordable point of care diagnostic test. So we're not asking asking for much. <laughs> it's a very difficult challenge, but we're looking to significantly reduce antibiotic misuse or overuse um, anywhere globally. So the way the prize is structured, it's first past the post. Um, so the competition has been live now since 2014, and we have multiple teams competing. Um, we're looking just for that one winner to win the £8 million payout, but we have funded multiple teams working in the diagnostic space. Um, so of course, being a prize, there's um, criteria that you need to fulfill to complete, uh, to compete, sorry. So we need something that's needed. Uh, we want to improve the antibiotic treatment decisions globally uh, using this diagnostic test. We of course need it to be accurate and affordable. Now what does affordable mean? Because we're looking at this on a global scale. Um, so really we're looking for something that can almost compete with the price of antibiotics um, and something that most healthcare facilities globally could afford. One of the key aspects of the Longitude Prize is that it needs to work within half an hour. And as you, many of you know listening, that's an extremely challenging criteria for these types of diagnostic tests. So what are we looking for in terms of infection type and the types of diagnostics that are competing? Well, one of those, of course, is diagnostics for sepsis and bloodstream infections. That's what we're here to talk about today. But we also have respiratory tract infection, urinary tract infection diagnostics across a big range of technology types. And we are um, currently working with teams that are looking at susceptibility, pathogen diag uh, diagnosis, and uh, viral bacterial differentiation. So there's a big wide range of diagnostic tests that we're looking at, which of course makes looking after these teams all the more challenging. So we have 57 teams currently competing with us. Um, we've had over 250 teams register with us um, to date, but these 57 teams are currently active. Um, as you would imagine for a UK prize, 
the majority of them are in the UK with 19 teams. But we also have a very strong partnership in India, um, of which Amrita has received some money through BIRAC, which is the Biotechnology Research Assistance Council, and they have been working with us since the prize began. Um, we also have, as expected, a lot of teams in the US, Australia, and some in Europe, including Sweden. So that's just a brief overview of the prize. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Till, who's going to give you an introduction to the webinar properly. Thank you. Good one. Um, I'm from the University of Edinburgh, and I will give you the introduction to today's slides, or to today's presentation. I have to move the slides. So, um, as you will have the recording of the slides, um, I thought I'd introduce um, or include uh, my contact details. So I'm very happy to be contacted in case there are questions later on. You also have my Twitter handle in case uh, you would like to see what we're doing um, in a more uh, global context. So um, without further ado, um, I would like to go uh, to the topic of today. Um, we are talking about um, bloodstream infections, uh, which are a major contributor to sepsis. And as you may uh, know, um, there is the Global Sepsis Alliance and we recently had the World Sepsis Day. And on that occasion, um, those uh, promotional slides or those infographics um, have been um, uh, produced and they depict the seriousness of the situation globally uh, around sepsis. So 27 to 30 million people every year develop sepsis. So it's a, a, a massive challenge, a, measure, uh, a problem of massive scale around the world. Uh, it it uh, breaks down uh, to a situation that 7 million to 9 million people die uh, every uh, every year, which means every, one death every 3.5 seconds. So in this situation, um, of course, infection has a, a major aspect. And um, on the right side, you see uh, the, the major contributors uh, to sepsis. And um, these are um, foremost pneumonia, uh, we have the bloodstream infections, we have abdominal infections, and we have uh, urinary tract infections. Now, uh, try to move the slide. With regards to infection, um, the initiation of rapid antimicrobial therapy and appropriate antimicrobial therapy is essential for survival. And on this slide, um, you see the uh, um, a very well-known study showing the dependency of survival and appropriate, uh, appropriate antimicrobial uh, therapy. So the survival fraction uh, goes down over time. Uh, if a patient is not on antimicrobial therapy, uh, if it takes, um, or if the patient is on antimicrobial therapy, um, the survival uh, rate uh, will be higher. So the cumulative effective antimicrobial therapy initiation uh, is of course increasing over time, uh, but uh, you lose every hour 7% of the patients in case antimicrobial therapy is not um, appropriately started. In this context, um, a bundle has been developed by the Sepsis Trust and this is the sepsis 6 bundle, and uh, which is widely used in the UK. And it contains uh, six um, measures um, in, after sepsis has been, um, um, uh, uh, after the suspicion uh, of sepsis has been confirmed. So um, it starts with the administration of oxygen, the uh, taking of blood cultures, giving of IV intravenous uh, antibiotics, in, IV fluids, the lactate checking, and the measure of urine output. Now, in this, a major uh, in the sepsis 6 bundle, and that's the use of diagnostics and the use of antibiotics, as you can see here. So, a rapid initiation of an, uh, uh, appropriate antimicrobial therapy following diagnostics would be ideal. Now, as you can see here, um, uh, item two says take blood cultures. And as you may know, um, until blood cultures are positive, 
sometime uh, for cultivation of the bacteria in the blood culture is required. And accordingly, um, the IV antibiotics are given empirically initially. Now, the, uh, the global threat of antimicrobial resistance is, uh, again, a very large one. And you, I'm sure you will have seen these slides uh, I'm showing here um, to introduce the AMR case. Here, what it shows on the left is uh, a modeling, um, a prediction of what will happen if you don't tackle the situation around antimicrobial resistance today. And this is uh, from the independent review on antimicrobial resistance, which was published here in 2014. Uh, so the initial um, uh, uh, modeling here was that if you don't do anything by 2050, uh, we will have 10 million deaths due to AMR. Um, uh, which is more than we have today on cancer, and this depicts the uh, the, the scale of the problem. And on the right side, uh, we see that the majority of casualties, the mortality per uh, 1,000 population, 10,000 population here is is that we have a huge um, situation of, uh, or the majority of um, impact is in Asia and in Africa. So with regards to the longitude price, um, there is, uh, this underpins the case uh, for having a, a rapid cost-effective diagnostic as Caroline has de uh, described it. Now, with regards to the tackling of antimicrobial resistance, uh, the independent review listed 10 commandments, if you want, uh, around uh, how we should tackle um, antimicrobial resistance. And rapid diagnostics uh, was one of the key features uh, which was repeatedly highlighted by Jim O'Neill, who's shown here on the picture. He also uh, brought up the, uh, the suggestion that by 2020, all antibiotic prescriptions should be done in, uh, in the richest countries around the world. Uh, um, only used or um, up-to-date surveillance information. Now, this was a very bold requirement or a suggestion to do uh, by 2020. As you know, this is next year. This year, um, we have uh, published in the UK uh, the five-year national action plan and the 20-year national vision uh, on AMR. And in here, uh, loads of um, uh, recommendations how we should use diagnostics to tackle AMR. But one major aspect here was that by 2024 now, we would like to know how many of the antimicrobials have been um, uh, prescribed after a diagnostic test has been used as a decision support tool. So some change of um, the, the, um, the aim uh, or let's say uh, an intermediate aim, but surely it shows that we, uh, a lot has to be done uh, yet. Now also um, this year, just in October, um, a, re a review of the progress on the AMR uh, review has been uh, published. And it was uh, uh, concluded that very little progress has been made so far and more has to be done in the area of the most expensive recommendations. So this is one reason why we are here today uh, and why uh, many initiatives around the world are still ongoing. Now, in terms of using um, diagnostics and uh, what the situation is uh, uh, with regards to patients presenting in the A&E department, this is an interesting study here which shows uh, which looked at the antibiotic prescribing in different countries here in the in Europe um, for patients, for children which have been presented uh, in the A&E department with fever. And you see here for upper respiratory tract infection, lower respiratory tract infection, enteric uh, fever without source and urinary tract infections. And here you see the antibiotic prescribing. What is interesting is, is that, for example, for urinary tract infection, you have across every country, you have very high uh, prescription rates, which means in essence that most of the patients, most of the children receive um, antibiotics in case the prescriber um, is uh, presuming a urinary tract infection. For the upper respiratory tract infection, uh, the spread is much wider as it is for the lower respiratory tract infection. That means that the uncertainty is very high. And this has been shown or concluded also by the authors, which said that a lack of a diagnostic standard uh, in these uh, situations. So a diagnostics is urgently needed. 
Now, the unmet need in clinical microbiology and infectious diseases is shown here on this slide. So the patient presents, the therapy is in, immediately started um, in case the prescriber makes that decision, but uh, a sample is taken, the pathogen is cultivated here in case of bloodstream infection in these uh, blood culture bottles. Once uh, the pathogen or once they have been positive, the drug resistance or the susceptibility test, as it's shown here with, with for example, the diffusion tests um, is done. Now, after this time, one would have a no or one does know uh, which antibiotics should have given in the first place. Now, so that means we need rapid diagnostics for therapy decision support for patient manage, as well as for surveillance and drug development. Now, in case of bloodstream infections, uh, we have a, a very specific situation that at the beginning, when the sample is taken, we have very few bacteria in the sample. Around 10 CFU per milliliter is uh, the lower limit uh, of bacteria, maybe one CFU even. Now, after cultivation, we have many more bacteria, uh, obviously, in the positive blood culture. That means that most diagnostic tests are going for uh, positive blood culture in the case of um, bloodstream infections. That is a technical challenge. Of course, uh, these low limits of detection uh, for 10 CFU per ml are very difficult to achieve. Now, there is a, uh, a spectrum of diagnostics in clinical microbiology uh, which can be used. Uh, we have broadly those here on the left, uh, which uh, target the organism. We have phenotypic tests and non-phenotypic tests. I won't go into um, very much detail here. Uh, on, and on the right, we have the host response uh, tests, which looking uh, for infection biomarkers, for example. And in, on the bottom here, you will see uh, these uh, key questions, which are very often or broadly asked is, uh, do we test directly from the specimen or do we need to cultivate? And as I just said, whole blood or blood culture uh, is the question uh, in the case of bloodstream infections. Now, there is this, uh, a zoo of technologies already out there, for example, here for molecular diagnostic systems, um, which can be or uh, are uh, have potential to be used in the infectious diseases space. And uh, they all have very positive um, uh, properties, but obviously uh, there's huge competition and uh, there is still uh, something to address, uh, which hasn't been addressed so far especially in the AMR field um, as we are working on and in, in the sense is in, um, uh, the WHO has uh, recently um, developed a recommendation um, on where activities uh, should be targeted with regards to, in this case, the uh, formulation of target product profiles. Now, what you see here on the left uh, is the uh, table showing the gaps in syndromic testings at level one and level two healthcare facilities. And those are described here on the right. What is important to look at is, is that at level two, uh, for bacterial identification, susceptibility testing and resistance testing, there is no availability of tests. So the, uh, this conclusion here shows that um, there's still a high need uh, for development and of course implementation of those tests in the, at this level of um, healthcare. Now, there have been, uh, we will have presentations on uh, technology in detail, uh, but I wanted to mention uh, two uh, bloodstream infection tests and technologies, uh, three different um, tests, which have been recently um, uh, mentioned or which, uh, which are around. And just as an example, um, at the bottom here, uh, we see um, uh, the, the technology uh, from DNA electronics, which is, uh, stands uh, for, or as, a, as an example for uh, sequencing uh, technology, which is uh, moving into the field of uh, bloodstream infection. This is the machine here. The important one is, is that um, the company aims to uh, develop something uh, which is identifying pathogens uh, directly from blood samples. And uh, what you can see here is, is that this is a cartridge, an integrated cartridge, which does the sample to answer system as a whole. However, this is still under development. 
One step further is um, the in terms of uh, the uh, product development and uh, the, the regulatory approval is um, accelerated diagnostics, uh, having a test here, which is integrating a whole set of technologies, um, uh, which is looking at the morphology, uh, some um, uh, uh, genetic markers uh, using uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization. Uh, and optical imaging. Now, this is a system which is shown here, um, again, targeting bloodstream infection, but uh, so far going for positive blood cultures. And on the top left here, uh, we see a system which very recently, again, uh, uh, was in the, in the news uh, with T2BI system, which got the CE mark just very recently for antibody resistant diagnostic. And that is a system which works directly from, um, from blood samples. So obviates uh, the need for blood culture. And this is based on a uh, magnetic uh, marker, which is based on uh, nanoparticles hybridizing um, to um, uh, DNA isolated from the sample. So these are technologies which are um, emerging. And of course, um, uh, this is a long path to develop a diagnostic test. And hence, um, uh, we have been looking here through the JPI AMR project, AMR rapid diagnostic tests, which I was coordinating into the commercial pathway to develop antimicrobial susceptibility testing systems. And that is uh, uh, showed, shown here uh, is the pathway um, the, uh, which is to be uh, uh, gone uh, to develop such a diagnostic test. And if you look down here, technical feasibility and R&D research design team. Um, uh, is, this is the area where we are currently here, if you think you're a technology innovator. Um, so what you can see is that there's a huge, and so it's, a, it's an undertaking which requires uh, many players and team effort. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, I just want to put, uh, point out one uh, aspect, uh, which is also on the, on the Card B website, um, uh, linked to our survey, uh, where we look for uh, your input into AMR diagnostics, teaching and training. And with that, I would like to hand over uh, to Amrita, who is uh, uh, the founder of SpotSense, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Over to you, Amrita. Thank you, Tiz. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Amrita from uh, SpotSense. Uh, we are working towards development of some of these point of care diagnostics, which can be used for screening tests and for uh, creating evidence based data before symptomatic analysis is done. Uh, so, the one of the first challenges that we had undertaken was actually to create a diagnostic for neonatal sepsis. And the reason neonatal sepsis is that still uh, it is the largest cause of mortality as far as children under one year uh, are concerned. And while we do uh, consider preterm birth as to be the biggest cause of neonatal mortality, the, more, the cause of actual death that happens is always an infectious disease, even in preterm birth, because they are uh, very, very severely immune compromised. So with that thought process, we wanted to create a point of care diagnostics for neonatal sepsis, which can actually be employed at the community level and not just the NICO level. Uh, so uh, uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, so uh, we were trying to understand what is the current diagnostics landscape for neonatal sepsis and uh, uh, more we spoke with clinicians, what we realized is there are two modules that happen in treatment. And uh, as uh, Till mentioned, the sepsis 6 bundle, the first one is always to identify the anti identify the causative organism and then uh, prescribe antimicrobial. And then there is another supportive care to maintain the physiology of the baby because that begins to rapidly decline once the baby uh, gets a septic shock. So there are two questions in diagnostics that we had to ask then. One was whether or not there is an infection. And second is how severe is the underlying condition and how much should the, uh, how should the referrals happen? Uh, how much time does the doctor have? Uh, does the treatment have to start immediately? Uh, also, uh, if you see on the right hand side, we have a chart that shows the time to positivity in ours versus accuracy of the current uh, diagnostic tests that are available, uh, especially in the Indian scenarios. Now, uh, the 
most the or the most well known analysis for neonatal sepsis is always clinical symptoms based so any uh, clinician that you speak with and or any neonatologist that you speak with would generally take an antibiotic uh, prescription decision based on whether or not the baby has a fever is uh, not conducive to breastfeeding or is having a uh, irregular breathing activities and it is only after that that blood culture is sent for and while a blood culture is considered the gold standard the time to positivity varies somewhere between 40 to 72 hours based on what is the stage of sepsis and also uh, they are not uh, accessible in a community setting so we were trying to bridge this gap and create something which would be uh, which would be extremely uh, quick which would be accurate and also it will be accessible at the last mile so again uh, next slide yeah so there were three uh, major criteria as uh, as in also with the longitude prize uh, which we were taking in to develop our diagnostic tests and the first one was of course high specificity because we were developing a screening technology and what we wanted to know is we wanted to rule out sepsis we wanted to be extremely sure that if this newborn does not have sepsis he or she should not be prescribed antibiotics and the second one was fast recognition so uh, right from the endotoxin release what is the time duration to which a clinical presentation happens which typically is around a day yeah, even in early onset sepsis but most sepsis protocols suggest initiating treatment within 60 minutes of that presentation and if the baby is not brought to the hospital immediately or is at home or in, not in an institutional setting doctors very often miss out on that 60 minute slot and the third of course was ease of use on we wanted to create a diagnostics that can be used by a health worker because a medical professional might not always be available or a trained lab technician would not always be available and that would cause a significant delay in getting the diagnostic data and hence a significant delay in referrals uh, so uh, these were the main uh, points with which we are creating our uh, sepsis test next slide So ours uh, is considering these three points. We uh, decided to go with a host response biomarker test rather than detecting the causative organism itself because uh, there was a certain delay that happens when uh, we have the causative organism come up to a level where it, it is diagnosed, it can be detected in the bloodstream. So we chose IL-8 as our biomarker of choice and the reason for that was there was uh, we didn't see a significant physiological change in IL-8 production and these are baseline levels uh, so there wasn't a significant physiological change based on gestational age at birth and since preterm babies are more or less uh, more at risk of getting neonatal sepsis what was happening is uh, IL-8 upregulation had to be similar uh, while not exactly the same and then uh, we what we also noticed was IL-8 production was evident in babies with gestational age as low as 23 weeks and then it was mostly stable in healthy newborns so there wasn't a physiological change that happens which comes uh, with biomarkers such as procalcitonin where a physiological uh, age also changes the biomarker considerably so we have also seen interleukin-8 to be uh, pre to precede C-reactive protein tests, which are currently well-used pro uh, point of care tech, uh, tests in in the community, especially. Uh, however, uh, in case of early onset sepsis, what was happening is there was significantly lower amounts of uh, ilate production, and that was owed due to less recruitment of neutrophils and then less expression of adhesion molecules. Uh, so I'll come to the case for early onset sepsis a little later. Uh, so what we decided to do was we actually did a, we did a large scale study in one of the hospitals in India with 120 newborns and around 280 samples uh, where uh, we had close to 90 samples for babies who were culture positive, who were bacteriomic and uh, around 180 babies who were late onset sepsis and 100 babies who were uh, facing early onset sepsis. So next slide. Uh, 
uh, yeah, so uh, if we come directly to our data, we have uh, we divided our tests in two parts. So what we were trying to do is we were doing one test as soon as the baby was brought in the hospital, and we were calling this as the first screening test. And then we were doing other tests uh, over next four to five years, uh, sorry, over next four to five days or till the baby was uh, discharged. And the reason we were doing these tests was we wanted to see the effect of once the antimicrobial therapy has started, can we still say that the baby is uh, septic if the baby hasn't improved, that is. Uh, so uh, on the first screening test, we were uh, getting some we got a sensitivity of around 80 um, 80 percent and a specificity of around 71 and then uh, for follow-up tests also we were getting a decent sensitivity of uh, 82 percent and specificity a similar specificity at that point these were however uh, predicting late onset culture positive sepsis and uh, the way we had divided our uh, entire sample population was we uh, divided them into sepsis cases that were bacteremic as well because we were not taking clinical sepsis cases as there was still a lot of ambiguity on whether or not to call uh, it sepsis. So next slide. Oh uh, yeah, so coming back to early onset sepsis, what we saw was there was a correlation that we were seeing in up regulation of both uh, salivary CRP and salivary iolate. Uh, and also, uh, so, so we forgot to mention this earlier, our entire test is based on saliva. Uh, so we do not do any blood tests and we do not do, uh, we do not do CSF testing. Uh, so our entire uh, test is based on saliva. It is non-invasive and it is extremely comfortable for the baby to undergo this test. So the gestational age and salivary iolate levels were showing some uh, significant co statistical correlation and so were gestational age and salivary CRP levels. Uh, and while we did not see the same with physiological age, what we noticed was day two at an early onset sepsis was critical and day two was showing uh, extremely uh, uncorrelated or upregulated uh, both uh, C-reactive protein and interleukinate. Uh, next slide. So uh, we have done for what we have done for early onset sepsis, and this is still a project uh, that we are working on, is we created an algorithm that actually takes into consideration that. So we uh, create a gestational age risk for every baby that is recruited in the hospital. And then we take into consideration what is the physiological age. And then based on the salivary iolate and salivary CRP levels, uh, we try to understand what, uh, whether or not the baby is susceptible to sepsis. So if you see on the left-hand side of uh, this, this graph, where uh, iolate and CRP actually have no correlation with uh, predicting sepsis. But then when once we assign them in our algorithm, the situation becomes slightly better. And while still not, uh, still not something that a doctor may want to use for 100% sensitivity, or 100% specificity, uh, when it is clubbed with the clinical symptom analysis, this actually gives a pretty good picture of what is happening. Also, uh, our pro uh, the device that we created was actually used over multiple days. So even in early onset sepsis, it was uh, conducted on the day the baby was born and then again for the next three days. And there, uh, what we are seeing is that the sensitivity then goes up and becomes similar to the graphs that we see in late onset sepsis. Next slide. Uh, so uh, that was uh, in small what uh, we did in our research. So where do we go from here? What we uh, intend to do is actually create a different standard of diagnostic protocol for neonatal sepsis. So right now uh, there is a standard of diagnostics where the baby is brought in uh, with clinical symptoms and prophylactic antibiotics are started and in parallel blood tests are performed. And then the therapy is continued or the baby is kept under observation or discharged based on the blood test data. Uh, but what we are proposing is as soon as the baby is brought in uh, with an infection to a, even a primary healthcare center or a simple maternity clinic, which may not have the facility or a pathology lab to do any testing, uh, the salivary infection screening uh, should be done immediately. And then once the prophylactic antibiotics are started, even then the doctor continues with serial testing uh, to assess the therapy effectiveness. Uh, 
and then blood tests are performed. So what this does is it actually also reduces in a way burden on the pathology lab or the burden on the patient or because blood cultures are always a lot more costlier affair. And what we are saying is uh, if we can screen through a certain salivary diagnostics, then the blood culture may not be required. Uh, if you look at the photo at top hand side, uh, that is our product. Uh, it can just be inserted in a baby's mouth and it works on a lateral flow assay principle and the test can then be brought out and read into a very simple readout, which we are also giving to the hospitals. We do have some unanswered questions uh, here. So uh, we have uh, like, we still do not know if there are cutoff points based on demography or ethnicity of the newborn because we have done our study exclusively in uh, a single hospital in India at present. And uh, that there might be some variations there. And also how do we separate out the effect that arise from developmental immune disorders? And while that might not be a significant challenge at present, uh, there is a lot of, uh, like the number of genetic diseases that are coming in a hospital or an NICU has actually increased over last few years. And their uh, sepsis may not uh, present in a similar fashion as it does in any other preterm baby. Uh, also what uh, clinical parameter should be compared for severity of the sepsis? Because one of the questions that uh, we wanted to answer when we started our journey was whether or not we can predict severity of sepsis or not. Uh, if it is just present or absent. Uh, so uh, that is what we are working on now. Uh, hopefully we will be able to create this diagnostic test and launch it uh, very soon. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone. This next slide. I think I, I'll hand over to David. Now I'm, now I'm un unmuted. Thanks Amrita for handing out and thanks to the organizers for putting this together. Uh, my name is David Anderson. I'm based at the Burnett Institute in Melbourne, where for the past 20 years or so, my lab has been working on lateral flow point of care diagnostics for a range of infectious diseases, and most recently uh, working on sepsis in particular. In order to describe what we're doing in sepsis, I really have to tell you about one we did earlier. And there are a lot of commonalities between a test that we developed uh, over the past decade uh, for measuring CD4 T cells in HIV infected patients uh, and what we're now doing in sepsis. And the overarching theme of this, we like to use the phrase of going against the flow, where we're using lateral flow technology, just like, uh, just like Amrita described and very much like a pregnancy test uh, using just a finger prick uh, sample of blood uh, instead of flow cytometry for things where flow cytometry is well established as a good biomarker, but obviously flow cytometry can't give the timely results in minimal healthcare settings that we need for these kinds of tests. And so our CD4 T cell test is a simple lateral flow test. Uh, there are two different versions of the test now on the market manufactured by our, our partners at Omega Diagnostics in the UK. Uh, and most recently, uh, just a couple of months ago, the Global Fund for HIV, TB and Malaria announced endorsement for procurement of the CD4 point of care test uh, for detecting patients with advanced disease. And so this sort of reassures us that tests built in this format can get out there with sufficient accuracy to replace flow cytometry in areas where that's not possible. And applying that to sepsis, uh, one of the most widely studied biomarkers for sepsis, uh, both in adults and in neonatal sepsis, is the expression of neutrophil CD64, uh, also known as the high affinity FC receptor, but this is a flow cytometry based test. And so even though there's been lots of publications showing that it works well with elevated levels of CD64 on neutrophils being highly uh, predictive of sepsis, uh, 
because it needs flow cytometry equipment, a lab that might only be available eight hours a day, it's had very little clinical impact. And so our aim was to see if we could turn that flow cytometry technology into a lateral flow test. And we took advantage of the fact that what we had learnt from our developing our CD4 test could be quite directly applied to development of a neutrophil CD64 test. Our R&D answered two specific questions. Uh, the first is, can we take a cell associated molecule, which would normally be measured by flow cytometry, and measure that accurately enough using lateral flow chromatography? And I'll tell you a bit more about that today. The second question I don't have time to go into today, other than to tell you that the answer is yes, we can have a monocyte removal step in a simple lateral flow device. We had to do that for the CD4 test because monocytes also express CD4, and we may need to do it for our sepsis test if we want to only measure neutrophil CD64 rather than neutrophil and monocyte CD64. That's still an open question whether we need to do it, but we know that if we have to do it, uh, we already have that solution in hand. So how did we actually make a CD4 test? Well, we uh, worked on the assumption and then established the proof that the amount of the CD4 protein antigen was directly uh, correlated with the number of CD4 T cells measured by flow cytometry. That is, the amount of CD4 per cell does not change during HIV infection. And, and in the graph here, you can see a very close correlation between the CD4 uh, count estimated by ELISA on the x-axis and the actual CD4 count uh, by flow cytometry on the y-axis. And so based on that, and, and there's nothing like skipping uh, eight years of working one slide, but we then uh, ended up with a lateral flow test where if you look at the uh, picture of the Visitec CD4 test in the middle, uh, it has a control line just to tell you that the test is operated properly. It has a reference line in the middle, in this case indicating a level of 350 CD4 T cells per microliter. And then the bottom line is the amount of T cell antigen that the patient has. And in this case, you can see that they have a darker test line than the 350 line. And in studies that we have published in collaboration with uh, many colleagues around the world, as well as with Omega, we've been able to show that healthcare workers with minimum training can get very accurate results with this test. And so we knew that we had the basis for making this kind of test and could apply that to sepsis. So the next step was to see, well, uh, sorry, I, I should just quickly give you a little bit more background on the CD64. I'll, I'll leave aside the uh, bit about uh, sepsis, the need for sepsis diagnostics, which has been nicely covered by Till and Amrita. But just to emphasise once again that neutrophil CD64 expression is well established as a good biomarker for uh, both adult and neonatal sepsis. But we had to show first, was it possible to adapt uh, neutrophil CD64 to a point of care test? And so we went through the same process we had for the uh, CD4. And as part of that, we had to measure the number of neutrophil numbers. So effectively having a, a neutrophil test like our CD4 T cell test, and then measure the amount of CD64 relative to the number of neutrophils. And if that was higher than the normal level, that might indicate sepsis. We have uh, a number of ongoing clinical studies which at the moment are not using our uh, prototype point of care test. They're primarily using lab-based ELISAs. Our main, uh, our main interest in terms of the mission of the Burnett is really neonatal sepsis because as 
and Rita mentioned, it, it really is a major cause of mortality in uh, children under one worldwide. But our major focus for uh, development and registration of the test is in adult sepsis because there are much clearer criteria for the diagnosis of sepsis in adults and we feel that that will help in the registration process. But we have studies in both adults and neonates uh, running in parallel. So the first question we wanted to look at is, well, if we do the equivalent experiment to compare uh, neutrophil CD64 versus CD4 um, versus neutrophil count versus CD64, I should say, would it look like what we saw here for CD64? Uh, for CD4, I should say. And we expected that we would see the same kind of linear relationship, but we don't. Uh, it should be the same, but when we tested it, uh, we found out that it is not the same. In fact, we see uh, a very different relationship where they are very, the levels of uh, neutrophils here measured by the amount of neutrophil elastase protein is highly correlated with the amount of CD64, but it is not a linear relationship. It's, uh, there is a plateau of CD64 that is rapidly reached. And this is really something that had never been observed before. We don't know what the mechanism is, and frankly, we don't much care, but we can use this information to guide our development of the test. But what you can see uh, towards the left-hand side of the graph is that when you have low levels of neutrophils, you do see that expected linear relationship where more neutrophils, you have more total CD64, but there is some feedback mechanism that limits the total expression of CD64 once you get above what would be pretty much the bottom quartile of neutrophil counts. And in the next graph, this shows uh, some of the early data we had when we looked at uh, adult sepsis patients in comparison. And the blue diamonds on this graph are the same control patients you saw in the previous slide. And so you can immediately see that uh, our sepsis patients, the majority of them shown in red, there are two distinctive things. Many of them, of course, have uh, high neutrophil counts and, and that's well known that neutrophils are often elevated in sepsis, but it's not enough to be diagnostic by itself. But even in those patients, whether they have high or relatively low neutrophil counts, they have very highly elevated levels of total CD64 protein using a lab-based ELISA. And the green arrows, which seem to have moved slightly, but there are four of these samples that are actually negative on the flow cytometry test. And it turns out that uh, some of the patients the CD64 is not sitting on the surface of the cells where it can be detected by flow cytometry, but is actually internal in the cells where it can be detected by our sorts of assays. And when we uh, look at the patients in the left-hand quadrant with the very low neutrophil counts, and of course, patients with neutropenia, and this is very common in neonates as well as in patients uh, undergoing cancer therapy, it's their neutropenia that makes them susceptible to infections and sepsis. Even with these uh, low levels of neutrophils, we can see that there are a, a higher than expected level of CD64 compared to the amount of NE. And so this is giving us a very good uh, sensitivity and specificity for the uh, detection of sepsis so far. So we're still in the process of building this into uh, a point of care test that will satisfy uh, our uh, target product profile. But I want to emphasize that the test will look almost identical to the CD4 test that's already out there. Uh, it will have uh, a, a port for addition of most likely uh, five microliters of whole blood from a finger prick sample. Uh, the test will remove monocytes if necessary. 
lyse the cells and then the proteins will flow along and we'll detect separately the CD64 and the neutrophil elastase uh, and then we'll have a procedural control and probably a uh, reference line representing the upper limit of CD64 where if you have a high enough level of CD64 it doesn't really matter how much uh, neutrophil elastase you have. And we don't anticipate that this test will be uh, perfect for a visual readout like the CD4 test is. It's a little bit hard to do arithmetic with uh, visual reads like this where we're comparing three different lines. But we've worked closely with uh, another company in Melbourne, Axon Limited, who may manufacture quite a range of uh, diagnostic readers, both for molecular tests as well as lateral flow tests. And the Axon readers are, are well suited to doing the sorts of algorithms, uh, not only incorporating the uh, test readout, but for example, uh, we could add gestational age, body temperature and any other clinical parameters that can improve the algorithm. And with that, I just uh, want to note that there's an awful lot of people to thank that I won't go through for all of those studies. Uh, but with that, I'll hand back to, um, uh, to Astrid and Caroline. Thanks. Thanks very much, David, and thanks to Till and um, Rita as well. Uh, so now we've got uh, some time, just over half an hour, to take any questions. So we've already had quite a lot submitted, but if you still have questions you'd like to submit, um, you can see online how to do that. Um, so let us start off. Um, so a couple of questions came in about access um, for lower and middle, middle income countries for these tests. Um, so the first was around the Longitude Prize, and the, the question is, um, is the Longitude Prize being set up to ensure uh, point-of-care tests go into lower and middle-income countries? So to answer that, yes, it's a simple answer. Uh, the Longitude Prize, one of our requirements is that the diagnostic test that will eventually win um, should be tested in at least one uh, lower and middle-income country. And we'd certainly be looking for a test with a price point that is affordable enough to go into, um, if not all, most of those countries. The second part of that question is about how these emerging technologies, these point of care tests, will fit into lower and middle income countries. So Till, what do you think would be the best approach to start supporting um, these sepsis tests at point of care in lower and middle income countries? So the question uh, is, uh, well, there are different aspects to this uh, in terms of um, supporting. Is the question targeting the technical question, the implementation question, or the reimbursement question? That's a good question. Um, so I think it's talking about just how we get these technologies into lower middle income countries in general. But I think potentially the finance, the reimbursement issue is, is the largest one there. Yeah, so yeah, so the, we had looked at many um, at the barriers for implementation um, of these mm -hmm. tests um, across and um, I mean the, that and, and the so reimbursement or uh, who pays for the test is, is, is the big question. And that is connected to how much does it test costs. Now we have a lot of debate about this at the at the longitude price and beyond that. Uh, of course that's that's the, the it's the key question. How do we implement uh, something which uh, uh, is, is technically very challenging as uh, our two other speakers showed. Uh, very tough to uh, get a, a biomarker measurement done uh, in, in, a, in a simple test. Now um, I, I think the, uh, the the ultimate approach to this is, is to show uh, that the, there is a benefit of using a test um, in the, in the right setting in the, in, the, in the right way so what is the the health economic at the end the health economic benefit of using a test and to do that uh, I think we need to have um, studies which show that benefit uh, 
and um, I think we have not enough of such studies. Um, so uh, if you ask me what would be, what do we need to be, uh, what needs to be done, I think we need to find mechanisms to have these demonstration trials, these trials um, which show benefit. Okay, thank you, Till. Yes, it's a complicated issue. Um, so moving on to more sepsis-related questions, perhaps I can pose this to Amrita. Um, one of the participants asks, are there cases of asymptomatic neonatal sepsis and how are those tackled? And do you know if the role of the gut microbiome of the mother is involved in developing early onset sepsis? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Caroline. So two very difficult questions. Uh, I'll take the first one. Uh, asymptomatic sepsis is actually very common in an NICU setting. So what happens is uh, if the baby is extremely preterm or uh, below 23 weeks or for some other reason immune compromised, they generally do not develop uh, clinical presentations of sepsis, even though uh, the bacteremia may, may be quite high. We have seen quite a few cases such as where the baby uh, seemed uh, to not uh, have any sort of hypothermia or hyperthermia, but was still uh, had a very high culture load. Uh, so we do, uh, it's not so much as being asymptomatic as it's being, we do not know the right symptoms for sepsis. I guess that is what I would like to call it. Uh, coming to the second question, gut microbiota, uh, there have been certain uh, studies that do correlate gut microbiota of the mother with early onset sepsis, uh, but I I don't think I'm the correct person to comment on what is the process there or like how is it transmitting. Okay, okay, thank you, Amrita. Thanks. Um, so David, perhaps I can pose this uh, this question to you. Um, so one of the uh, participants asked. Uh, does the upregulation of CD4 plus T cells occur in non-bacterial disease? And how does the upregulation of the CD64 occur over a time series? Is there suppression later in the condition? So the CD4 really doesn't uh, change in response to bacterial infections at all. The CD4 is really only relevant to the HIV infection. But the CD64 upregulation uh, appears to be all bacterial infections, uh, most likely fungal infections, and probably not in a, a pure positive strand RNA virus infection. Uh, so it probably wouldn't come up if you had a common cold, but it probably wouldn't come up if you had a respiratory tract pneumonia due to influenza or respiratory syncytial virus. But we certainly don't have the same confidence that we will detect sepsis as a consequence of viral infections as we do for sepsis from bacterial infections. But it is fair to say that some of the patients we have tested who have been positive their clinical diagnosis was influenza. We had a bad flu season and we had quite a few sepsis patients who were there because of flu and they were coming up positive. You never know whether that's because they've got a secondary bacterial infection uh, as well though. And that's really one of the advantages of looking at a host biomarker is that you're looking at what your body is seeing rather than just what organisms you can detect. So the second part of the question in terms of the, uh, the changes over time in the patient, CD64 comes up quickly, so it's a very early marker of severe infection, and it resolves fairly quickly after you start uh, successful antibiotic therapy. And so it can potentially be used to monitor the uh, effectiveness of therapy and to time the withdrawal of therapy once the patient uh, has had the benefit. Okay, thanks very much, David. Thank you. Um, so sticking with you, David, for, for a moment, um, we also have a question asking about how the monocytes are depleted in the lateral flow assay. 
Um, well, I'm going to assume that that might be an immunologist asking that question, so I'll hope that they will understand the answer because it's a little bit complicated. But there is a, a commercial reagent called uh, rosetzep, uh, which agglutinates the cells that you don't want with the patient's own red blood cells and then pulls out those red blood cells. And so we have a component of the device that is impregnated with that rosetzep reagent against uh, monocytes. When we add the patient's blood, their red, their red blood cells agglutinate together with their monocytes, while uh, the CD4 T cells, in the case of our uh, T cell test, the neutrophils in the case of our sepsis test, essentially all of the white blood cells except for the monocytes flow through into the rest of the test where they uh, react with detergent and then the solubilised proteins flow into the lateral flow device. Okay, thanks very much, David. So, Tell, back to you and a more general question now. Um, so countries with well-functioning healthcare systems have a lower impact in terms of AMR. I think that was a comment you made in your introductory slides. And the speaker is asking, why is that? Sorry, the participant. Yeah, I think it's important to, to, uh, to specify that in terms of the, the countries having a lower impact on AMR. Uh, is maybe not the correct term in, in, or the way to describe the slide. So the, the slide showed uh, from the independent review on AMR, um, the postulated um, uh, mortality uh, due to AMR. Um, and so the overall mortality in those countries is higher due to infectious diseases. Uh, hence, the, uh, there is higher incidence of the uh, AMR related um, mortality in, in these countries. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't fr uh, frame it in a way that uh, countries have uh, specific impacts on AMR uh, with regards to this slide. I think the the driver under uh, research um, uh, overall there is a uh, understanding that um, the high use or use of antimicrobials correlates uh, with the rate uh, of AMR. So the higher the use of antibiotics, the higher um, the resistance rates in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, however, um, there are different ways to address those. So the impact um, of countries on AMR um, uh, may have different reasons, uh, but vice versa. Um, there are uh, clearly countries where AMR has a higher impact on the healthcare system uh, than in others. Don't know if that addresses the question, but the um, I think that we need to have uh, global solutions, but we also need to have country-specific solutions and healthcare-specific solutions. Yes, thanks, Phil. Yes, not an easy question to answer. Um, to come back to you, uh, David, now, one of the questions, or a few questions, in fact, that's come in ask about adding additional biomarkers to, to your CD4 tests. And I know at the Longitude Prize, we've seen several steps of tests uh, with a panel of biomarkers. Is this something you would consider doing, or do you feel the CD4 marker alone is strong enough, uh, has a strong enough correlation? Yeah, we're, we're certainly very open to looking at whether other biomarkers may be able to be included with the CD64, but you start to get a real trade-off in cost. Uh, we, we want this test to be affordable, like the CD4 test is, and as soon as you start building in extra biomarkers, the cost of manufacture goes up somewhat exponentially because you have you know, three, four, five variables instead of one or two that you have to uh, monitor in quality control, et cetera. And so you know, we, could make, we could make a test for 20 biomarkers if we just wanted to publish it in Nature. But if we want to make 10, 100, 200 million of them a year, with adequate quality control, 
that is a limitation of lateral flow technology is that you really can't have uh, very large numbers. But there are approaches that can, we could look at you know, three or four biomarkers and something like C-reactive protein uh, or procalcitonin uh, would be obvious ones. And we are measuring those in the lab uh, and we'll be doing that analysis. But we're certainly very open to look at others if there's good evidence. Thanks very much, David. Um, I also want to stick with you for a second and ask about lateral flow as a technique, as a method. Uh, one of the participants asked about, well, so lateral flow is obviously one of the strongest candidates when it comes to these types of rapid point of care tests. So why have so few successfully reached the market and what challenges do you face in terms of working with lateral flow? Yeah, it, it, it is true that a lot of them haven't uh, been successful in the market. There are an awful lot of them that have been developed. Uh, but one of the big problems, and, and which we at the Burnett uh, try to address directly for our own innovations, uh, as well as key innovations in areas of unmet medical need that are of interest to us, is no one's doing those implementation and health economic studies, which Till mentioned earlier. And so you can have a good test and you just put it on the market and walk away and expect it will sell itself and policies will write themselves. That isn't going to happen. And no one is going to be a better champion of these tests than the people who helped to develop it. Uh, and we look to work with key opinion leaders to really uh, establish, well, demonstrate feasibility and implementation and then uh, cost effectiveness uh, and working all the way through to policy development. And that hasn't been done for most things. But if you look at things like HIV point of care tests, including now uh, home self tests, you look at malaria, uh, lateral flow tests. There are about 250 million malaria lateral flow tests used worldwide each year and that has contributed uh, enormously to reduced death rates uh, from severe malaria. But there was a lot of work put into demonstrating the public health effectiveness and cost effectiveness of those tests and that's something that we are very focused on once we overcome the technical problems in making a test that can be manufactured at scale. Absolutely, thanks very much, David. Um, the issue of bringing diagnostics to market is of course an extremely complex and challenging one. Um, so to return to Amrita, Amrita, obviously working on or working in neonatal sepsis is extremely challenging in terms of bringing um, clinical trial participants into into your trials. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you overcome those obstacles and, and how it, difficult it can be to, to work in this area. Uh, yeah, so it is extremely difficult, especially when you are working with newborns who are extremely fragile and uh, already immune compromised and already septic. Uh, first first response of any clinician is actually to not let any new technology near them and that's that's very well taken actually uh, we were lucky because we uh, had this collaboration with uh, the hospital in india which is cmc Vellore. Uh, but to also uh, i would like to go back a little on how we started this journey so actually when we had first started exploring the idea of uh, finding a biomarker that can predict neonatal sepsis we uh, did create a test that was a biomarker array so it had uh, more than six uh, biomarkers and uh, we uh, could collect saliva and then uh, even for collection of saliva which uh, would seem like a more feasible option than collecting blood uh, we had to do multiple design iterations because most of these babies uh, they were sick or uh, they were not able to open their mouth or they were already intubated. 
So there were several challenges in conducting the study. And then uh, during that study, what we realized was if we are only going to get this much saliva, which uh, in our case is 20 microliter, we never get more than 20 microliter saliva from a baby, uh, then what is that one biomarker that we want to focus on? So I think that that is uh, another concern uh, from what David was mentioning earlier on what is the trade-off that you do if you do a multi-marker assay uh, is uh, you also need a very high sample volume. And uh, collecting samples is of course definitely a challenge which is why we have uh, also not been able to done this test still in a community. We have been working with uh, neonatal uh, ICUs but having said that, given the utility of such a test, given the utility of a fact that once as soon as the baby is brought in, you can test whether or not the baby is septic. That is something that uh, clinicians have really appreciated and that has been one of the reasons why we have been allowed uh, even and uh, we have also been able to be part of a lot of discussions on neonatal immunology and how it develops and how it uh, how it actually can be measured. So, uh, so yeah, I think community uh, diagnostics is, it has its own challenges and uh, doing a clinical validation is certainly the biggest of them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amrita. Um, I want to ask both David and Rita about comorbidities and how they affect the development of the diagnostic. We had a specific question about a potential up regulation of CD64 in the context of malaria. Um, and I know at the Longitude Prize, a lot of our diagnostic developers struggle with the idea of developing a global diagnostic where so many endemic diseases could affect the outcome of those tests. So I wonder if you could touch on, on how you deal with those complications. Yeah, uh, I think the really all we can do is uh, look at whether that is a, um, a factor. The, the literature suggests that malaria won't be a problem, but I'm less certain that we won't see uh, problems with uh, chronic helminth uh, infections and other parasitic infections. Uh, but we really need to do those studies in the field uh, we are interested in starting to collect samples from populations in those areas and we, we do have a couple of nascent collaborations to do that uh, from areas endemic for malaria, etc. Uh, and to a large degree, that's not necessarily looking at sepsis patients, that's looking at patients with those other diseases. So uh, I should have mentioned earlier, the Burnett's main infectious disease interests are HIV, malaria, TB, and hepatitis viruses. So we have a lot of uh, work going on in those diseases, particularly malaria, that are important comorbidities. Thanks, David. And perhaps the same question to you, Amrita. Uh, so for us, the biggest uh, comorbidity that we were struggling with was actually a respiratory distress because it is so common in a, a newborn as, uh, or especially in a preterm newborn and respiratory distress has been known to increase the inflammatory stress of the baby. And if you're using any inflammatory marker, the first question that you have to resolve is, will this be high also for a respiratory uh, disorder? Uh, so uh, what we have done is most of the babies that we recruited even uh, we recruited in three categories. One were culture positive uh, sepsis babies. One were completely healthy babies without any comorbidity. And then we had babies that had very high serum CRP levels and they had uh, some sort of respiratory distress or pneumonia. And even for those babies, we were uh, they were negative on our sepsis test. So uh, more or less, we have been able to prove. Uh, of course, uh, we would require a much larger sample set on proving the opposite of this hypothesis that the test does not uh, say positive in case of uh, comorbidities alone. And that is something that we are uh, currently doing. Okay, thanks. And, and staying with you, Amrita, um, a more specific question. A participant asks, uh, can you take urine from a neonatal uh, patient and could that help your, your test? 
so urine tests also have been developed especially uh, for uh, inhibitory proteins and certain uh, anti-inflammatory proteins for sepsis and i think few of those teams are also in uh, the longitude prize uh, what happens in collecting urine is why while it is slightly easier to do that for a male baby for a female baby that becomes difficult and one way of collection of urine then becomes catheterization that by itself induces some sort of local inflammation and we weren't able to separate out that uh, local rise of uh, cytokines or local rise of chemokines versus a systemic. So saliva seemed like a better uh, option because that's more uh, resting and then the transport of cytokines from bloodstream to saliva are happening in a more, uh, they are happening over hours and they are not immediate rises. Okay, thanks, Amrita. Uh, so now a question on the Longitude Prize. The participant asks, if there is one prize of £8 million for a single winner, even though different tests may be required for different clinical situations, is this the best way to pay out the Longitude Prize? So it's a really good question. And I think um, we are supporting 57 teams at the moment, and they are all working on different technologies in different areas of microbiology. I think the eight million pounds needs to be a high amount so we can incentivize a winner to get to the stage of development we need for them to win. So we're really asking for a diagnostic test that's almost ready to go to market. And for that to happen, we need a large incentive. But you are right, we're not just focusing on that one winner, we're also supporting these 57 innovators. And we've given out multiple grants, interim grants throughout this process. Um, and we also have an investment process um, where an independent investment fund are investing three million pounds into Longitude Prize applicants. So as much as we have this one payout, we're also focused on developing as many of these diagnostic tests as we can to make the biggest impact in the market. So I hope that answers your question. So we're running out of time here, I think, for the webinar. So perhaps we can ask the closing couple of questions. So I want to ask both Amrita and David what your plans are for further development of your test. Where do you want to go from here? Uh, Amrita, I'll go first if you like. Um, yes, please go ahead. We, we have... Uh, plans once we have the test work uh, satisfaction probably work with a service provider to do the um, validation have the capacity to do that ourselves through a spin-off company established in China but that company is really focused on very simple lateral flow tests, not the kind of quantitative tests that would uh, be suitable for FDA uh, and high level uh, regulatory processes. Because the, the thing I should emphasise, I think, here is that while the, the overwhelming need for the point of care tests in terms of numbers and impact is in low and middle income countries, there is a very difficult pathway to registration of a product if we try and prove it for sepsis in those countries where you can't diagnose sepsis with any confidence. And so our plan is to focus on most likely the US as well as the European Union to get product registration uh, where, for example, procalcitonin has product registration even though it's not very good. And so because there is a predicate test, because there are very good clinical pathways for diagnosis and management of sepsis, you can have that good gold standard of sepsis diagnosis to compare your test to, which is also why we're focusing on adult sepsis for our product registration, because there is that consensus definition of sepsis 3 uh, that is accepted worldwide as that is a patient with sepsis or not having sepsis. But then cheap enough that we can then sell it in the low and middle income countries where it's most needed. 
Uh, okay, so I guess uh, we'll discuss our plans. So uh, initially we had plans of doing our entire product in two phases. So phase one, of course, being a screening test for sepsis, which we do specifically for all the healthcare systems. And then uh, the phase uh, two part was, of course, creating a test that is also able to differentiate between comorbidities and is a lot more sensitive and a lot more specific. And there the idea would actually be to uh, sort of make the current uh, other complete blood count test and WBC tests redundant. So we are going ahead, uh, like in the first format, we are going ahead with getting the product approvals, at least in India. And uh, we are hopefully planning to launch the product next year, at least for the Indian market. And then from there, we would go ahead and uh, perhaps uh, distribute the product in other uh, low and medium income countries. OK, thanks both. Uh, it's great to hear your plans. So to finish up, Till, I want to ask you the final question, and perhaps it's uh, one of the most difficult. But how long do you think uh, we will need to wait before we can see a uh, test like David's and Amrita's reach the clinic. And what steps do you think we could do to try and speed up that process? That's a very important question and very good question, of course. Um, and uh, the rule of thumb uh, was always uh, 10 years until we see um, a test in uh, in the clinical adoption and in clinical uh, use. Now, how can we speed that up? Um, unfortunately, that question is not e easy to, to answer. So there are multiple ways um, uh, how, um, uh, or which are multiple ways which are discussed, um, how this could be um, sped up in, in, in different um, committees and groupings, et cetera. Uh, generally, I think um, there is uh, a lack or um, of, uh, pull incentives um, uh, to introduce uh, diagnostics into the clinic. So those pull incentives, uh, as it is uh, discussed today, has been implemented for uh, for new therapeutics that would be certainly helping uh, to ease the financial burden for diagnostic test developers and make it more attractive. So I think at the end it boils down to a um, um, uh, an, an economic barrier, and uh, those economic barriers um, need to be addressed, and uh, diagnostic test uh, use needs to be made sustainable. But um, it's, a, it's a very complex question, but I think uh, in essence that's what it boils down to. And of course we need to convince uh, clinicians of um, the utility of these tests, as I said initially. It's a health economic question, but it's also it's the trust uh, in the test and the benefit of use for using it. Thanks, Jill. Not an easy question to answer. Um, so as we draw to a close, I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Till, Amrita and David for their stimulating talk and to thank the organisers, Astrid and Garpi, for organising the webinar. So for the last few minutes, I'll hand back over to Astrid, who will give the closing Remarks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Carla. All right. Um, thank you, Caroline, Caroline, for moderating the session. Of course, thank you very much, uh, Teal, Amrita, and David, for, for sharing your experiences. Um, I want to point out that this was a, a bit of a special webinar for, for us. We had uh, three speakers and a moderator and us all across four different time zones. And I'm sure also our audience is, is all over the world this time. Um, so I would thank you all for taking the time to join us, um, especially David. I know it's very late where, are you, where you are. And I want to apologize to the audience if we, ha we had a few little technical glitches today. Some audio maybe wasn't ideal. So if you missed some Thing, or if you have any further questions or also if your questions couldn't be answered anymore today, please feel free to reach out to us and we will see, um, try to get some responses for you from the speakers. Um, this was the last webinar for this year. Um, but we will soon be announcing our 2020 webinars, or at least the first ones. So please uh, make sure to check out uh, the Revive website and uh, keep an eye out for my emails. I hope you will join us again next year. Uh, also make sure to tell your colleagues about our webinars and encourage them to join as well.
uh, with this, I would like to thank you all for joining today and for contributing to the discussion. And I really hope you found it uh, interesting and useful. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks very much.